What I would like to say before we give it over to Gary um, is how much I admire his work. He's been a friend for a number of years, but Gary brings me joy not only as a friend but as a, as a writer. I read his book with, uh, with the same passion that you know, brought me to books and, and literature. I wake up in the morning thinking oh, I'm going to read more of Little Failure. It is, of course, always fun to be, bear witness to someone else's failure. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, he is a fantastic writer, and we, of course, know that. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Um, I would like Gary to read first one of the sections uh, from the early part of the book, so as to prove my point, um, <laughs> how, uh, what a great writer he is. Uh, the best thing about this book is clearly the cover. Um, this is 1974, and it's a uh, photo studio in Leningrad, USSR. Uh, and they had these photo studios, I don't know if you had them in Yugoslavia, where they would pose a child with the latest in Soviet technology, so like a phone, you know. <laughs> so chapter two features me crying on a phone uh, at a studio. But then they put me in this car, and most kids would grab the wheel. I was just sitting there very shyly, and only this year at age 41 did I learn how to drive. So now I can live outside of New York, so <laughs> watch out, Chicago. <laughs> Seriously, watch out, I'm a terrible driver. If you see me coming, I, would, I wouldn't drive any further. Um, so the, the section I'll read from to start with is when we emigrated to America uh, in 1979, and uh, I was immediately had to learn English and some Hebrew because I was sentenced to eight years of Hebrew school for a crime I did not commit. But, <laughs> 1980 was a difficult time to be a Russian in America because, remember, Ronald Reagan's evil empire speech and all those movies, Red Dawn, Red Gerbil, Red Hamster. <laughs> so I had to pretend to the kids in Hebrew school that I was actually born in East Berlin, not in Leningrad. And you know things are bad when you have to convince Jewish kids that you're actually a German. <laughs> uh, plus, we were really poor. I had one shirt and one pair of pants and a bunch of t-shirts the parents of the kids in Hebrew school had donated. Uh, my toys were a pen and a Chewbacca action figure someone had given us that was missing half of his paw. And I had from Russia a fur coat and a fur hat made out of some woodland animal. And the teachers would actually take me aside and say, you really need to get rid of your fur. You know, kids will play with you more if you're furless. Uh, <laughs> which is actually true in adulthood as well. I, I, I learned the hard way. Um, and then two years after we left Russia, something truly incredible happened that almost changed our lives forever, and I'll read from that section. In 1981, an official letter arrives in our mailbox. Mr. S. Shitgart, you have already won $10 million. <laughs> sure, our last name is misspelled rather cruelly, but cardstock this thick does not lie. And the letter is from a major American publisher, to wit, the Publisher's Clearing House. I open the letter with shaking hands, and the check falls out. Pay to the order of S. Shitgart, ten million and zero zero slash one hundred dollars. Our lives are about to change. I run down the stairs into the courtyard of our apartment complex. Mama, Papa, we won. Me, millionaire. We are millionaires. Calm down, my father says. Do you want another asthma attack? Around the glowing surface of the orange dining table imported from Romania, we spread around the contents of the voluminous packet. For two years, we have been good news citizens, accidentally watching X-rated movies on Main Street, Emmanuel, The Joys of a Woman, getting jobs as engineers and clerk typists. My mother's pianist fingers will finally be put to meaningful use. Learning to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and for the something for which that it stands, Unavoidable with money for all. Bonjour, <laughs> moi, my mother says. My God, as we look at the pictures of a Mercedes flying off the deck of our yacht toward our new mansion with its Olympic sized swimming pool. Oi, does it have to be a Mercedes? Pooh, Nazis. <laughs> Don't worry, we can trade for a Cadillac. Bonjour, moi, how many bedrooms does this house have in the picture? Seven, eight, nine. You said the kids at school have houses like this. No, Papa, this one, ours will be bigger. The way I understand that the house doesn't come with the prize. The prize is just 10 million, and then we buy the house separately. Phew! They always say here, sold separately. 
You can forget about the yacht, Gary. It's dangerous. But I know how to swim now, Mama. How do you keep the pool open in the winter? Snow will get in. Look, there's palm trees. Maybe it's in Florida. I want to live in Miami. Maybe there aren't Hebrew schools in Miami. <laughs> Everywhere in America, there are Hebrew schools. <laughs> we sit down and, using our collective 400-word English vocabulary, begin to unravel the many documents before us. Well, it says here that yes, we have already won the $10 million. No disputing that. But a panel of judges still has to award the money to us. First, we must fill out the winner's form, and to select five national magazines that will be sent to us free, or at least the first issue of each will be free, and then the Americans will likely send us the rest of the $10 million. Fair enough. First, we must acclimate to our new wealth, expand our literacy. I'm proud of Papa's new car, a bulbous 1977 Chevrolet Malibu Classic with only. Seven million miles on the odometer, but it's time to get acquainted with the finer autos. So I order car and motor, motor and driver, carburetor and driver, muffler and owner. <laughs> and for the last selection, something that maybe has my Star Wars monkey Chewy Chewbacca in it, Isaac Asimov science fiction magazine. We sign everywhere we need to, even places we probably don't need to. I walk solemnly to the mailbox and deposit our claim on the future. Adonai Eloheinu, I pray to our new God, please help us get the ten million dollars, so that Mama and Papa will not fight so much, and there will be no razvod divorce between them, and let us live somewhere far away from Papa's wolfish relatives who cause all the trouble, and let them not yell at Mama when she sends the money Papa says we don't have to her sisters and Grandma Galia in Leningrad, who has been dying for a very long time. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> If only my bar mitzvah had gone that well.、Uh. <laughs> that night in my dreams, I walk into the Solomon Schechter Hebrew School of Queens, a multi-millionaire, and the pretty girl with the big teeth, who always, who's always pant for the vacation, kisses me with those big teeth. I haven't gotten the mechanics of kissing down yet. The kids make fun of Jonah Himmelstein, the school's biggest loser. But I say he's my friend now. Here's two dollars. Buy us both the Carvel flying saucer cookie ice cream and keep the change. You gurnished, you nothing. We find out the truth quickly and brutally. At the respective workplaces, my parents are told that the publisher's clearinghouse regularly sends out that you have already won ten million dollars missive, and that these are routinely thrown in the trash by the savvy native-born. The pressure settles over our non-millionaire shoulders. In Russia, the government was constantly telling us lies. Wheat harvest is up. Uzbek baby goats give milk at an all-time high. Soviet crickets learn to sing the Internationale in honor of Brezhnev's visit to a local hayfield. <laughs> But we cannot imagine that they would lie to our faces like this here in America, the land of the this and the home of the that. And so we don't give up hope entirely. The judges are probably reading our application right now. Maybe I should write them a letter in my burgeoning English. Dear Publishers Clearing House, spring is here. The weather is warm and rainy. Birds come from the south to sing us songs. My mother's pianist fingers hurt very much from all the typing, and she has only one suit for work. Please send the money soon. We love you, Family Steingart. <laughs> Meanwhile, car and parking in the other publishing clearing house magazines are starting to pile up. Taunting us with many hot, naked centerfolds of the new Porsche 911, the official sports coupe of Reagan-era excess. We reluctantly begin to cancel our subscriptions to all of them, except for Asimov Science Fiction Magazine, a small, square little number with the drawing of an exciting, molting space creature on the cover, hugging a boy in its claws. Our dreams of being instantly rich are finished, but we are moving up nonetheless. We are saving every kopeck that comes our way via my father's junior engineering job and my mother's typing. Here's our inventory. I have my pen, my broken Chewbacca monkey, my recently circumcised penis, my Soviet atlas, and a bunch of donated T-shirts. My mother has the size two Harv Bernard business suit. My father has made a fishing rod out of a stick. Pounds of disgusting Markdown farmer's cheese and kasha will feed us until we die of sadness. And if I don't clear my plate of that warm, soggy crap, the thunderclap of Papa's hand rings against my temple. My mama yelling, "Just don't hit his head! He has to make money with his head!" <laughs> Or Mama's week-long silent treatment will make me consider taking my own life altogether. Who are we, parents? Me, biedni. We are poor folk. Why can't I have Chewbacca with both paws? Parents, we are not Americans. But you both have jobs. We have to buy a house. Yes, a house. 
the first step to Americanism. Who needs two pod chewy when we can soon have our quasi-suburban home? But at lunchtime, the Hebrew school boys do like to take out their Lukes and Obi-Wans and Yodas and set them on their desks to demonstrate just how much property falls within their purview. They talk in their already raspy Jewish voices. I threw out my old Yoda because the paint on his ears was falling off, and then I got two new ones and a Princess Leia just so Ham Solo could do her. <laughs> Me, amazed. Wow. Thank you. Despite those early challenges, your parents um, are fond of this country at this time. Right. Are they not? So they did get their house in the end, in Long Island. Yes. Um, have they read the book? Uh, my parents, uh, I sent them a copy of this book, um, you know, in express mail uh, a couple of weeks ago, so I haven't exactly heard back. Uh, <laughs> there is a family witness protection program in Tucson that's welcoming this time of year. Um, the other thing is also in their honor is that th their English isn't perfect, so for them to understand this may take a little more. Uh, my books usually come out in Russia eventually, so hopefully, or hopefully not, <laughs> the, the translation will await them. But they, they did know that you were writing a book, and you interviewed them and, you know, verified facts. Yes, yes, this was a, a fact. I was on a fact mission where I interviewed them for many, many hours. They were very sweet about that, maybe 20, 30 hours of interviews. And then I took them back to Russia, and they've never been back. My father's never been back for about 35 years since we left. I go back every year to, to suffer, but, you know, he, he, they, they've, been, they've been not going back. So what do you expect the reaction to be? From the book. Right. I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. Um, the book is... When I, before I started writing the book in my 20s, I was sort of very full of, you know, unadulterated, pre-therapeutized immigrant rage about the fact that they were so different from me. The fact that they, that my father was a little free with his hands and that my mother, you know, called me little failure as a nickname. Um, but in writing this book, and I hope that this comes across when they read it in either language, is, you know, those feelings of anger began to be replaced with just these feelings of sorrow. Like, my God, I can't believe you grew up where you grew up. You know, I realized in interviewing my father that the first four memories of his life, somebody's coming to the door telling him his father, he's like three years old, that his father has been killed at the front out near Leningrad. Then being evacuated from Leningrad while the German bombers are attacking the train, they're hiding under the train. This is a three-year-old kid. His best friend dies of starvation. Um, you know, uh, is is cousin jumps out of a building uh, to the second floor because she's pursued by rats who are trying to eat the little children. And then he goes back to Leningrad, he hides under the kitchen table crying for years and singing opera, that's his dream, to become an opera singer even as a little kid, and dreaming of going back in time so that he could kill Hitler and, and his father would still be alive because he's stuck with this horrible stepfather who was very violent and whom his best friends have nicknamed Goebbels, you know. So, this is their lives, you know, and, and I sort of knew some things about them, but in writing this book and interviewing them, and I didn't want to glorify anyone in this book. I, I come across as a jerk for large parts of it, too. Um, but I also didn't want to skimp on what had gone, you know, the sort of the, the, the mission to uncover how we became the Steingarts that we became. Um, there is a, you mentioned rage. Um, and anger, and I, well, I think that one of the sources of humor in general is often anger, and it's a, it's a positive conversion, as it were, that people, and many people from all parts of the world, from Eastern Europe, they convert accumulated historical or personal, um, uh, how would I put it, cultural rage, and convert it into humor. And so what I respond to in your work, um, both in the, in the novels and uh, in this book, is... Um, this humor, it's a particular kind of humor that ha it contains the energy of rage. Can you talk a little more about uh, the, the way humor works no. for you? Right. Well, uh, and thank you. I, I actually look for, for those qualities in your books as well. Um, I think that people from our part of the world, either, either we laugh at this stuff or it just drags us down to infinity, you know. Um, the way I like to see it is, being a Soviet Jew, being a, a sap, a Soviet Ashkenazi pessimist, you know. <laughs> how, how does that happen? 
you know, the way I visualize it, there's an exploding Chernobyl-style reactor, right? And there's a Russian running away from the reactor. And then there's a Jew running away from the Russian. <laughs> and I'm that Jew, right? And, and, and so the whole system just leads to just a, a kind of deterioration of civil society. Um, there's very few people you could turn to. And my parents, when they were growing up, the one thing I could count on was their humor. You know, this was the one thing that was constant. They were fighting with each other. We began to have a lot of problems. Um, they hated where they lived. When we got to America, they adapted in some ways faster, but there was a lot of, I mean, you know, we, we came with nothing, as I'm sure something you know about as well. We, we got our mattress out of the dump and folded up some sheets to make a pillow. Um, so there was a lot of tension, but the humor was always there. I mean, the first thing I remember as a kid was a, a Brezhnev joke that my parents told me. Uh, and I, have I told this joke in Chicago before? No? Can I tell it? it it's great because it's, it's, it's Olympic based. So since we're about to have the world's best $50 billion Olympics ever in, in Sochi, uh, most of that money stolen, uh, it'll be fun to tell a Brezhnev Olympic joke. So it's the 1980 Moscow Olympics and Brezhnev hobbles up. He's completely senile at this point and he has to give the opening speech. So he comes up to the, to the, to the podium. And, and he's given a piece of paper, you know, and he starts reading the paper. Oh! <laughs> mm. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> and his assistant runs up and says, Comrade General Secretary, those are just the Olympic rings. <laughs> so that kind of joke, which is both funny and performative and, you know, and, and full of anger at the society in which you live in, which is this doddering, senile society where nothing good ever happens. Um, that's what I grew up with. So it's a nice sort of what you were talking about, the conversion of, of, of uh, humor from rage. There's also a, 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 an aspect of survival and humor that is, you know, if you live through it, you can laugh at it. Right. It's difficult to tell the jokes about the um, predicament you're in, but once you pass that, once Brezhnev's dead, yes. you can tell, oh, it's senile enough to be laughable, then you can tell uh, jokes about it. But um, your relationship with Russia is interesting in more ways than one. Of course, you know, the first book is the Russian Debutant's hand, um, Handbook. Absurdistan refers to the former Soviet lands in more ways than one. Super sad true love story has a little bit less of that, but still contains. Whereas in this book, of course, finally in this book, it is obviously essential to who you are as a writer and as a person, that the history and the culture of uh, Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, where do you see yourself right now in relation to Russia and a related question in relation to the United States and particularly its literature? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think this book was in a way, a way for me to say, I'm going to take a little break from Russia now. I've, I've, I gave it the office, you know, I, I put in my dues, uh, three and a half books about Russia. Um, a lot of people who emigrated, I mean, you came at a much later age, so it's obvious that Bosnia is going to play a, a huge role in your writing. But I came at an age where a lot of my contemporaries don't really care so much about the place where they came from. I think the obsession with Russia began partly because it was a language in which I wrote my first books. My grandmother, who used to be a, a journalist for Evening Leningrad, which is much better than Morning Leningrad. <laughs> Morning Leningrad is sort of the TMZ of... of <laughs> I said that in my LA reading and I realized, oh my God, half of you write for TMC. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, but um, she was a journalist and she said, and I love cheese, and she said, for each piece of, for each written sheet that you write, I'll give you a piece of cheese. So I wrote a hundred page novel for a hundred pages pieces of cheese called uh, Lenin and His Magical Goose. And it was about Lenin invading Finland with a talking goose. Um, and creating a socialist revolution there. And in the end, we find out the goose is Menshevik, and Lenin eats the goose for that. <laughs> and I remember my grandmother was saying, you know, okay, well, that's maybe too far. Maybe the goose gets exiled to Mexico, and then you know, an ice pick. <laughs> but I love writing. I mean, even today, Random House pays me mostly in cheese. And, but I loved writing so much that I loved the Russian language, because that's what we spoke. 
And when we came to America, it was a shock that I had to learn English. And I was so bad at it for so long. I had an accent way more than a, way further than a kid who came at my age would. And, you know, at home we only spoke in Russian. And that was a nice thing that my parents did because that allowed me to maintain Russian. Usually when the kid speaks English in the house, it's better for the parents because they learn English a lot faster. So my parents never learned English to the level where they could understand this thing, thank God. Um, but on the other hand, I retained my Russian, so it was much better that way. Um, so Russia was always the question in my mind. Why are we the way we are? Where does the unhappiness, the depression, the anxiety, this huge anxiety come from? And in going back to Russia when I was in my 20s, I began to understand part of it. But then in talking to my mother and my father, you know, my mother has an entire album that's Uncle so-and-so, 1943, family buried alive photos, you know. That's not, you know, your Cape Cod summer vacation photo album that many Americans have. It's a shocking book, you know, and this is what they grew up with. And, you know, and they were all buried alive, and my, my mother grew up with this constant fear of also of, some, of falling asleep and thinking, people thinking she was dead and being buried alive that way. So that's the next generation. The generation after that, for me, is uh, I'm scared of subway cars because I'm scared that I'll die in one of them if the train gets stuck between stations. So, you know, happy progressions of Ativan from one <laughs> generation to the other. Um, but Russian literature played a, an important role in your um, human and writerly upbringing. I mean, when you write, do you have a, a, an additional referential system in addition to, you know, the English language literature? Well, when I write, a lot of the times and when I'm writing about uh, Russian characters, uh, there's a kind of second soundtrack in my mind. I, you, do you have this in, in Bosnian as well, where you're... Well, um, I would call it soundtrack, but there's, you know, there's a particular literary tradition in, in mm -hmm. my background that I can mm -hmm. never get out of and never really right. try. So that, right. yeah, um, you know, studies have shown that bilingual children yeah. have a capability of a very simplified, uh, a very simple way to put it, is to look at things um, um, from two different points of view at the same time, exactly. as opposed to monolingual. And this, if you bicultural, what happens is, in, and if you're a writer, you're able to compare, as it were, traditions and uh, have uh, two troves, at least, to which you can, into which you can reach to you know, find ways to resolve problems. Well, that's it. Problems. That's it. That's it. That's why you, Conrad, the Nabokov Meister, you know, you're all... You really have those, those, those two. But, but so do you. Do you write in Russian still? Could you write in I, Russian I if you wanted write to? I could write very, very sadly. I write a lot of emails in Russian with, with some horrible misspellings. Um, but the, the language, when I do dialogue especially, the Russian is, is, is still deep in my mind, as are the stories, the Chekhov stories that I grew up with as a child, because that's, we didn't have a TV, so I w didn't know what was happening on Buck Rogers in the 25th century, um, set in New Chicago, by the way. But I did have Chekhov, so all the little kids were running around talking about the A-team, and I was stuck with Lady with Lapdog, you know. <laughs> um, oh, God, how I love those stories. You know, and, and I wasn't fully able to comprehend the full moral value of what they represented, but somehow there was something so important about them, you know. And my father was invited to parents' teacher's night at the Hebrew school, and the teacher said, we hear your son reads Dostoevsky in the original. And my father said, only Chekhov. <laughs> <laughs> um, but absolutely, th th that, was, that was the beginning of, of, of everything for me. And without the Russian literature in, in the background, I don't, think, I don't think I would have become a writer. Now, you started writing early in English, too. I mean, yeah. um, you have a section that describes one of their first writing experiences oh, in Hebrew yes, school. Yes, yes, yes. Let's I, hear that. I will read it to you. So I. After we didn't win the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes, um, because I was the red gerbil, the second most hated boy in Hebrew school, I thought, what if I wrote a science fiction novel, sort of like Buck Rogers that the kids keep talking about, but maybe they'll learn to like me. And so I would write in these 100-page notebooks. Uh, this one is called Invasion from Outer Space. Chapter one, something is wrong. <laughs> You get the idea of what my life was like, <laughs> in general. Um, and then when I was about 11 years old, a momentous thing happened in the guise of a substitute teacher called Miss S. So I'll read you that section. On one of our first days on the job, Miss S asks us all to bring in our favorite items in the world and to explain why they make us who we are. I bring in my latest toy, a dysfunctional Apollo rocket whose capsule pops off with the press of a lever, 
but only under certain atmospheric conditions. Humidity must be below 54% Fahrenheit. And explained that I've even written my own novel. And this passes largely unremarked as the latest batch of Star Wars X-Wing fighters and My Little Ponies are paraded around. Finally, Miss S holds up a sneaker and explains that her favorite activity is jogging. P.U., a boy cries out, pointing at the sneaker and holding his nose, and everyone except me laughs their wicked child laugh. I am shocked. Here is a young, kind, pretty teacher, and the children are intimating that her feet smell. Only me and my 200-pound Leningrad fur are allowed to smell around here. I look to Miss S, so worried that she will cry, but instead she laughs and then goes on about how mm, running makes her feel good. After we have all finished explaining who we are, Miss S calls me over to her desk. You really wrote a novel? She asks. Mm, yes, I say. Mm, it is called The Challenge. May I read it? Mm, yes, you may read it. I will bring it. And brink it, I do. <laughs> With the worried admonition, please don't lose Miss S, okay? And then it happens. At the end of the English period, when a book about a mouse who has learned how to fly in an airplane has been thoroughly dissected, Miss S announces, and now Gary will read from his novel. <laughs> his what? Oh, but it doesn't matter because I'm standing there holding my composition notebook straight, straight from the Square Deal notebook people of Dayton, Ohio, zip code 45463. And looking at me are the boys with their little flying saucer yarmulkes and the girls with their sweet aromatic bangs, their blouses studded with stars. And there's Miss S, who I'm already terribly in love with, but who I've recently learned has a fiancé. Not sure what that means. Can't be good. <laughs> but whose bright American face is not just encouraging me, but priding me on. Am I scared? No, I am eager, eager to begin my life. Introduction, I say. The mysterious race. Before the age of dinosaurs, there was human life on Earth. They looked just like the man of today, but they were a lot more intelligent than the man of today. Slowly, Miss S says. Read slowly, Gary. Let us enjoy the words. I breathe that in. Miss S wants to enjoy the words. And then I continue slower. They built all kinds of spaceships and other wonders, but at that time the Earth circled the moon because the moon was bigger than the Earth. One day a gigantic comet came and blew up the moon to the size it is today. As I'm reading it, I am hearing a different language come out of my mouth. I do full justice to the many errors, the Earth circled the moon, and the Russian accent is still thick but I am speaking in what is more or less comprehensible English. And as I am speaking, along with my strange new English voice, I am also hearing something entirely foreign to the squealing and shouting that constitutes the background noise of my Hebrew school. Silence. The children are silent. They are listening to my every word, and they will listen to the story for the next five weeks as well, because Miss S will designate the end of every English period as Gary Novel Time. <laughs> and they will shout out throughout the English period, when will Gabby read already? <laughs> this is close to Long Island. Uh, and I will sit there in my chair, oblivious to all but Miss S's smile, excused from following the discussion of the mouse who learned how to fly, so that I may go over the words I will soon read to my adoring audience. And God bless these kids for giving me a chance. May their God bless them, everyone. God bless them for giving you a chance. <laughs> now, other chance. than cheese, <laughs> other than cheese, what drove you to write novels at such an early stage? What drives you still? I fear that if I stop writing, I'll go back to being the red gerbil that I was growing up, you know, because I made my first American friends when I wrote these books, when I wrote um, my satire in the Torah called the Gonorrah, where <laughs> Exodus was replaced with Sexodus, and, you know, and... The entire Jewish race was supposed to come out of Brooke Shields or Brooke shields -Owitz, as I renamed her. This went over really well with the boys in school. Um, look, it was, you know, it was a bit of comedy, a bit of class clowning, but at the same time, I learned how to speak English when I got up in front of people and, and, and spoke. I learned to really master the English language. The sad part was that I began to sort of leave my parents in a way already because these 
this was not Lenin and his magical goose. These were completely different, a different way of looking at things. And the more I wanted to please others, the more the weird life back at my parents' house with, with the Chekhov and the Kasha and the, you know, sporadic bursts of rage, but also incredible humor, all that seemed somewhere locked up in a, in a different universe. And I think this was the beginning, these little composition notebooks was the beginning of my journey away from my parents to as far away as, you know, the, the Marxist-Leninism of Oberlin College, uh, as far from the republicanism of, of Soviet Jews as you could find. But it's also into the English language, which they still do not have access to in some ways. So which, that, who? Uh, your parents. Right, which they... So that you could write novels or books in English and they would be entirely your own and they would not be subject to uh, their harsh judgment. Except when the Russian translations came out. And then, <laughs> and then I wish we could have family book burning night. That would be a nice way to <laughs> get things going, you know. But no, they're, you know, they're, they try to understand, you know. At my wedding, Deborah Treisman, the fiction editor of The New Yorker, came up to my father and said, uh, so what do you think of your son's work? And he said, the first book was okay, you know. <laughs> and I was like, really? He thinks the first one at least was okay? I'm so happy, you know. <laughs> That's a, it's the first step. It was the first step, because when, when that one was published, he called me a mudak, which is a kind of testicle man, if you will. <laughs> I went from testicle man to okay in the span of 11 years, so... That's 11 cool. more, and this one will be okay, too. Uh, your first book was more than okay, of course, and, and one of the uh, pleasures of reading Gary Steingart regularly is uh, following the trajectory, or, or I don't want to say development, but the move um, toward the kind of maturity that is appropriate for his age and mine. <laughs> um, in the sense that, you know, the first books could be roughly, the first two books, uh, and even the third one, could be roughly described as satire. It was hard to detect the real Gary Steingart in it, though, you know, there were some similarities to his main characters. So, but then with this book, there's a leap away from pure fiction, from satire, uh, while the, um, many things from the, from the novels we retain, including the brilliant language, the brilliant use of language, and the wit. And then, um, well, I'll stop here. So I want you to talk about this leap from fiction, or satirical fiction, mm -hmm. to confessional memoir. It's quite, those are, in some ways, quite apart, but then, as it turns out, not so much. Well, th and thank you for noticing the the uptick in maturity. Uh, well, but no, seriously, thank you, because, uh, you know, turning 41, uh, or that's 67 in Russian years, uh, <laughs> and, and, and having a kid, you know, my, my kid's a couple of months old, and all these things coincided, I think, the fact that I knew we were going to have a kid and writing this memoir and also ending analysis or about to end analysis. All these things came together. Um, the progression, the first book, The Russian Debutant's Handjob, was written... Uh, <laughs> Mostly at Oberlin, when I was a student there, it was published in my 20s. And when you're at that age, you're looking in the mirror all the time and regard moi, you know, it's that kind of feeling. Um, I'm not dissing the book. I'm just saying that it was, that it was a lot of self-involvement, as it should be at, at, at that young age. It's very rare for a writer to come along at that age and, and sort of... Um, I'm thinking of my mentor, Cheng Ray Lee, who wrote in his 20s, but he was already writing about older men and stuff like that. That's very rare. Um, Absurdistan was a full-blown satire. It was sort of my anger at what had happened to the former Soviet Union. It roughly was about Azerbaijan and Georgia and the other countries of the Caucasus. It was just me at my sort of full tilt, fulminating satirist mode, um, channeling Gogol much more than Chekhov or anyone else. Um, Super Sad was a departure for me in the sense that it is a satire, but there's two characters. Uh, Lenny Abramov is the typical... Soviet Jewish nebbish stand-in that I have, um, but Eunice Park was a 24-year-old Korean-American woman, um, and I loved writing her stuff so much. It was just such so freeing for me to finally leave myself and try to think, oh my God, other people have lives too, and try to burnish some empathy for that, for, for another person's point of view. Um, this book is in some ways a return back to, to, to the Soviet Jewish nebbish, but here, because there is no satire, the safety net has been slightly removed. Um, you can't go back to the rhythm of humor that a satire has, which is funny, 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 I'm going to sneak in something serious, funny, 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 um, I'm going to sneak in something serious. Here, the humor exists, but the humor is sort of this 
ICBM intercontinental missile that's launched to the audience, but the payload, the uranium, is, is, is pure sadness. This is such a Soviet metaphor. <laughs> Sorry, well, I, I'm still thinking of, you know, first strike, how can we uh, invade America first? Um, it's just the cosmonaut in me talking. Um, but it, the payload is, is, is the sadness, and, and, not, and not the other way around. The humor isn't, isn't the... Not even the sadness, but the meditated sorrow, let's just say. Meditated historical sorrow. In a way, it's... This is a... It's an unhappy love letter to, to my parents, really. It's a demanding love letter to my parents. Um, and the other three books had Russian parents, fathers and sons, mothers and sons, but they were always sort of subjugated to grander ideas about, you know, an absurdist stand about global politics and super sad it was about the, the way technology is invading our lives. Um, but you could also always say, this is, this, this is fiction, these are novels. Yeah. I use some, which is how it works, really, when you write fiction. You use some personal experiences, but then you um, turn them into something else. So you add things, you make up stuff, and you do not care about the truthfulness of your particular experience entirely, because you can add characters, you can lie, as it were. Whereas in this book, and particularly with, uh, with your parents in the equation, as it were, the book is dedicated to Gary's parents and ends with, I don't want to give it away, but now I have, uh, the picture of his parents. So there's a, and we're in the situation where you publicly expose yourself to, um, you know, something that is intimate, that's something that um, has operated inside the family for, for many years. It's a courageous act. Therein lies the maturity. It doesn't mean that other books are lesser books, right. but it's a, it's a kind of leap. How did, how did, I mean, did you, what kind of courage, what kind of decision did you have to make to open yourself up to all that? Uh, the other, um, person to whom the book is dedicated is your, your analyst. Talk a little bit about right, that. Right, and, and I want to also commend you. I mean, you wrote uh, the, the book of my lives is something which is Sasha's latest book, which is a collection of essays, but which reads as a memoir. I mean, I don't know what the distinction is, except one sells more than the other. Memoirs are supposed to be the, the ne plus ultra of selling. Um, but your, your, your book was of huge influence as I was writing a uh, little failure because because of the incredible, I mean, the incredible openness that, that you exhibited in that book, but at the same time maintaining all the Hamonian traits that we've come to love you for, which is, you know, the, this, the, the succinct but absolutely right word that you always use, and, and also the use of humor, which is drier perhaps, but, you know, which is just, we just, we just make different martinis, minor, <laughs> minor wetter, I think but I love yours as well. But going back to the, my shrink, look, you know, this, I'm not one of those pathetic New York Jews that sees their shrink five times a week. I see him four times a week. Um, <laughs> so this isn't Woody Allen type stuff. This is, uh, and only 12 years. It's only been 12 years. So we are ready to, to end things. Um, but a lot of this book did come through psychoanalysis in the sense that you lie there and you say something and you publish it into the air. It already exists in front of you. The traditional psychoanalyst doesn't say a word. He just sits there probably tweeting, you know, whatever you're saying. <laughs> There's no, you know, the, the, in traditional analysis, she or he is the, the sounding board, you know, the, you project upon that sounding board. So for 12 years, I spoke and spoke almost everything that is in this book. I mean, then some level of artistry had to come in, but so much of it was said aloud in psychoanalysis. So much of it was explored in psychoanalysis. The second step was I, I spent several summers upstate in a little cottage um, where there is, thank you AT&T for not being a functional company. My iPhone didn't catch any signal, you know, so I could actually think and write. So I would wake up and say, okay, I'm 11 years old right now. What's, what are mama and papa fighting about? What's gonna happen in Hebrew school? How do I get the 60 cents for the Carvel cookie ice cream so that I can be a human being in the eyes of others, you know? How do I get to my grandmother, the one I love, who's going to take me by the hand, even though I, I could be 15 years old and she's so scared of people in the streets of Queens, she'll still take me by the hand from the school bus to the apartment, which is half a block away. You know, all these little details would sort of cascade into me and I would write them down. Um, and it actually became quite depressing over a span of time. The myths were easily punctured. Uh, in my mind, I always thought, well, once I left Queens and Hebrew school and that whole parochial world, I entered, you know, like a dragon, I entered Stuyvesant High School, the sort of the holding pen for multinational nerds in, Queen, in Manhattan, and I was welcomed, you know, by thousands of nerds and become their leader and et cetera. <laughs> but in, in, in interviewing people from my past, 
I was the same clownish kid, ever virginal, always trying to, act, you know, always sort of manipulating my way into, always acting in this kind of very fake way, being funny all the time, but not really being anyone real. Um, and in writing this book, I realized another thing that the sort of the breakthrough wasn't even the writing so much, but as it was having uh, my first girlfriend in, in college. Uh, this Oberlin is where you go when you can't get laid anywhere else, you know, and this is sort of where the elephant men of the world congregate looking for someone with an equal sized trunk and her suitness, etc. Um, and so I was able to find actually a lovely young woman who. Um, who I'm open, I opened up to. I, I always had these bullshit friendships with men, you know, as, as young boys do. But finally, in finding a girlfriend, I would just talk for hours with her. Oberlin doesn't require much attendance in class since you're majoring in the Beatles or whatever. Um, <laughs> but I did, you know, I, 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 we would send 15, 20 page letters to each other. This is when letters existed across campus. And so a lot of in reading these letters, and she saved all of them, thankfully, and I was able to read them, and I really began to see a further development of myself as a writer, the writer that would write the Russian Debutante's Handbook, which I began writing while seeing this woman, because I had a confidant, you know. I had somebody who I could tell everything to, and she went back to see my parents, and she took down her own notes, and I was able to see my parents through different eyes, you know, which is the same thing you do in psychoanalysis. So, in a sense, the breakthrough for me really came from having a girlfriend. And I knew all along that that would happen. If only one day somebody would love me back, um, things would begin to fall into place. Um, now you are married. To a woman and everything, yes. To the, the whole package. The whole package. Um, could and be a have, man. And you have a son. Yeah. Um, that's the package. Uh, who is four months old. Um, of course, the, the, the question that comes up is, Will he be writing a memoir ha! 40 years down the road? And oh. if so, what can you contribute to it? It, it, would, be a, uh, it would be titled, uh, They Loved Me Too Much. Or, <laughs> or Smothered by Love. Smothered by Love. <laughs> Perfect Dada takes me to Disney World. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for not circumcising me at age eight. <laughs> These are all the great titles. Yeah. Uh, what would he write? I don't know. But he should write whatever he wants. I mean, look, you, you rate my parents, my Fox News parents raised this, you know, so <laughs> the kid I raised will surely be a tea party Hasid or something, you know, <laughs> settling on the West Bank, shooting everyone in sight. I'm sure that's the, well, you it's always were, the opposite. You were a Republican at some point. I was, oh my God, you know, um, uh, at age 11, I was a subscriber to National Review. <laughs> William F. Buckley uh, on the cover, no, Margaret Thatcher on the cover, uh, on every cover. And, and, and the other thing was at 11 I got uh, this beautiful card that had um, an eagle sitting atop two rifles. So at age 11, Igor Steingart, my name then, was welcomed into the National Rifle Association. <laughs> Never too young for the Second Amendment. <laughs> um, is it time for questions? Or it is time for questions. I, my job is done. Thank you, Gary. Thank now you. it's your turn to ask him all the probing questions. Thank you, Sasha. Hi. It's such a pleasure to meet you in person. I read your first book and I loved it. Thank you. And the question that um, is very important for me personally, because I was a journalist in Russia, and when I moved here, I lost the ability to write in either language. So I know you moved here when you were seven, mm -hmm. and you, but you said you started writing in Russian. How did you make the transition? How did I make the translation, transition from Russian to English? With great difficulty. Um, I was always a year behind the other kids. My English was terrible. Um, I remember having to write a book report on the Colosseum in Rome, and the book report was, had roof, not anymore. That was, the, that was my summary of the Colosseum, you know. And it sucked so badly because, you know, I, my grandmother always told me you're a brilliant writer, and in Russian I was, I think, fairly advanced for writing a Bolshevik-Menshevik soap opera at age five. Um, but it hurt. It hurt not knowing the language. Um, and in the Hebrew school, Hebrew was being piled on top of that, and that's a language I never quite learned. So it, it was too much. And look, you know, I mean, there's a weird thing. I, I'm a writer, but... I'm actually not good at languages. This, this is a weird kind of 
thing. I mean, do you know more? You, you speak Bosnian and English. Do you speak other languages? Do they come naturally? See, that's interesting. I, I, I lived in Italy for a long time. I, I got the accent and this, <laughs> but that's all I learned for you know, years in Italy. Um, I lived in the Czech Republic, um, and Czech is a Slavic language like Russian. All I learned was, you know, how to say, uh, I'd like beer with French fries and sorry for 1968, you know. That, um, <laughs> but that's really all you need to know in, in, in Czech. Um, so it's, it's hard, you know, at, at, at school, in Hebrew school, I would sit at a lunch table and just talk to myself in Russian because it was so comforting. And the kids would go, blah, 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 you know, because they thought it was completely nuts. But it's a difficult transition to make. But what two good languages to have? A Slavic language and English, you know. The Slavic languages are so expressive. Uh, they're, they're not romance languages, but there's something quite melodic about them as well. And then you have English, which is great because its vocabulary is insane. There's, it's like one of the... I think there's nothing even remotely close to the size of an English vocabulary. Uh, the Germans do okay, too. Uh, but how wonderful to have another language. And I'm sure my kid will grow up speaking Mandarin like all New York City kids. But uh, that's a good language, too. You know, so. On your book also, you mentioned the over-eager immigrant prose. How do you think uh, the immigrants write? And I mean, I read books from immigrants, and I read local authors, I can also feel some distinction. I would want to get your take on how is the writing of immigrants different than local writers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of it comes with the fact that what a writer is always looking for is a sense of conflict, you know. And if you're born in one country and you emigrate to another, well, the, the conflict's right there, you know. So many native-born writers will write about, you know, at a, at a formative age, what are they going to write about? Well their parents divorce in Scarsdale or Winnetka or something like that. And, you know, those are fascinating topics, but Updike has done a lot with that stuff and, and, and others. And I'm not discouraging divorce fiction here, you know, I think it's lovely. But I'm saying that what we bring is just, is just so, especially since, I mean, how many Bosnian writers writing in English are there, you know? So when you need something like that, you, Sasha Hammond's your man. Uh, Indian writers, we have, uh, some of my best friends are writers like Akhil Sharma and Suketu Mehta, and then there's Jhumpa Lahiri, uh, Dominican writers like Juno Diaz, Korean writers like Chang Ray Lee. I mean, in some ways, we really are at the huge forefront of, of American fiction at this point, which is very nice because it's, this doesn't happen in other countries so much. Um, Germany has a huge Turkish population. I don't see this gigantic, I mean, there are Turkish novels, but it's not like a gigantic, uh, you know, explosion of, 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 of German-Turkish lit. Now, there is something else, though, which is weird, that countries like Germany will translate 30-40% of their books from other languages. We translate at best 2%. So it's almost our stance is that we, uh, we don't like those smelly people from abroad, but the immigrants are, you know, they're safe enough that we can trust them to sort of be a bridge between them and Bangladesh and you know, and, and uh, Nigeria or whatever you have. So, so Americans prioritize writers, immigrant writers, but they don't prioritize actual living writers from other nations, unless they're Huraka Murakami or, or, you know, Nobel Prize winners, yeah. But even so, you know, plenty of Nobel Prize winners, uh, what's her name, Jelinek, the Austrian writer, she won the Nobel Prize and she sold, you know, 17 copies in Boston and that was it. So, <laughs> even that doesn't seem to impress the American audience so much. But for some reason, and I mean, I certainly benefit from it, but immigrant writers have been a vogue for a very long time. So I have a question about the reading Chekhov at home. I've known other Russians who came over at about your age. I was born here, so I only speak English. But, um, and they said that their understanding of Russian literature and their Russian vocabulary stopped at about, you know, fifth grade if they came over when they were 10 or seven or eight. And, and I think in most of these households, the, there was peak in English at home, like you said, so the parents could learn English as well. Um, so when did you stop reading Chekhov and start reading like, you know, Tom Swift or something like that? That's a good question. I stopped reading Chekhov and everything else when we got our first television uh, when I was about 13. <laughs> the Sony Trinitron with an advanced remote control. Oh my God. I remember watching Gilligan's Island thinking, how the hell could a country as powerful as America with its, with its powerful navy not rescue the millionaire and his wife. I mean, shouldn't they devote all their freaking resources to saving these two? 
but that's when it stopped. So this is, this is the, the interesting thing, you know. So my mother would call me a little failure when I, when I said, I'm not going to be a lawyer the way you want me to. I'm not going to go to law school. I'm going to become a writer. Sounds terrible. But on the other hand, my parents did everything they possibly could to make sure I was a writer. Not having television, not speaking in English around the house, uh, having only, you know, only quality literature in the house. I mean, we went down as far as Leon Uris, but it was all uphill from there, you know. And I love Leon Uris, great stuff. I'm full of exodusing myself. Um, but, you know, so, so this, is the, this is the strangeness of it. Also, they worshipped America in a big way. You know, the, the, the capitalist aspect of it was surely, I mean, coming from the Soviet Union was like, coming to America was like landing in a sea of technicolor after some black and white Soviet flick. You know, it was, it was amazing. It was wonderful. But my parents always thought, you know, it's interesting that Americans are so rich, but they don't seem to be as cultured as we are, you know. Because remember that in Russia, in the Soviet Union, nobody really did anything. You know, everyone earned 200 rubles a month, but nobody worked the way people work in America. Nobody worked themselves to death, you know. You'd do a couple of hours, then you'd drink a few, and then you'd read Chekhov, and that would be the day, you know. <laughs> So I was so happy that some of that was preserved within me, and it was all, only thanks to my parents that that happened, you know. So, and then they also provided me with the material for this book, so... <laughs> I think royalties, as meager as they will be, can be split between them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gary Steingart. Come back anytime. Thank you so much. <laughs>